Sure. Well, thanks, Ben, and, and thanks to all of you guys uh, for joining us. You know, I want to start today by sharing my condolences on the passing of all-time Turk great and, and college football Hall of Famer Jack Scarbath. Uh, you know, on the field, man, Jack was a, a first-team All-American and runner-up for the Heisman Trophy, but more importantly, off the field. What a great, great man um, who loved the Terps and represented, you know, us proudly. And I've gotten to know Jack, had gotten to know Jack over the years, having spent 13 years here. And the entire uh, Maryland football family has Jack's family and friends and former teammates uh, all in our thoughts. Um, our team is excited to get back. Uh, into a routine with Rutgers this week, uh, game mode preparing for Rutgers. Um, we've got a tremendous amount of respect for their program and me personally, a tremendous amount of respect for uh, Greg Schiano, who I have gotten to know uh, pretty well and intimately over the last five years and having gone against Greg as an assistant, you know, since 2005, uh, have the utmost respect for how he prepares his team and the types of teams that he uh, puts on the field. They play hard, they play tough, they're relentless, and, and pretty much have taken on uh, the personality of their leader. And, and that's what you see when you watch Rutgers on film in all three phases. Um, you know, we're also excited to honor our seniors uh, this week. You know, we've got a group of, it's a small group, but it's a group that has been through a lot during their time here. And the, uh, the guys that have stuck through all of the, the, the ups and downs uh, over the last five or six years that these guys have been a part of our program. Uh, we want to send these guys off the best way we possibly can. And being back here at home in the shell uh, for only the second time, um, our guys are excited uh, to try to go out and, and play with the habits and behaviors we need to have the success. Um, they're a special group. We want to send them out the right way. Um, and before I take questions, uh, our game captains for uh, this game, our home game against Rutgers, are Antoine Richardson, uh, Jake Funk and Johnny Jordan. And so with that, I guess I'll open up to any questions you guys may have. Thanks, Coach. We'll start with Alex Stacy. Hey, Coach. Uh, hope you guys are doing well. Thanks again for taking a few minutes here. Um, two things, one logistical and then kind of just one uh, more about Rutgers. Um, first thing, uh, is everyone returned from uh, from the COVID protocols? I know this is the first week that everybody – you know, was eligible to be back. So uh, are, we, are you guys missing anybody right now? Uh, for the most part, uh, most of the guys that have been affected are, have been cleared uh, to play for the most part. Cool. Uh, and then the second thing just about Rutgers, um, what have you seen sort of, uh, you touched on it a little bit in your opening statement, but what have you sort of seen change uh, with them from last year to this year, especially now that, uh, you know, Greg Schiano has taken over uh, and that they've definitely seen some steps forward this year? I mean, I think the big thing, and when you look at last year, a little unfair for us to judge because they were uh, playing for an interim head coach who, you know, again, I had a lot of respect for the job he did keeping that thing together. So um, I just think you see consistency um, in in the product. You know, we talk about, you know, when, when I watch the film um, from a macro view as a head coach and I watch all three phases, you just see a bunch of uh, players that are really playing hard and playing with great effort and, um, you know, obviously they're building that thing up there. And, but, you know, having to got, gotten to know Greg over the last few years, it's really, you know, you see them taking on his personality of how he approaches the game, just a tough, hard-nosed, blue-collar work, work ethic. And, and that's what you see. I mean, these guys fight for four quarters. They play with the right kind of mentality. And it's, it poses a great challenge, especially, you know, for us being a young team. And as I like to say, still in that growth phase, um, you've got to bring, you got to bring it. You got to bring the mentality and match the intensity in which they'll play with. And that's why they pose such a great challenge, but what a great opportunity for us here at the shell against a good team. And that's what we need and want. We'll go to Emily. Hey Mike. Um, there were a few people or seniors not listed on, on the senior day honors or is, does that imply that their, their plans are to um, stick around another year? I think it was Tayon, TJ Bradley, Sam O. Um, type people? Um, you know, most of these have been individual decisions. You know, we kind of, those guys have the ability if they wanted to be honored, they have exhausted eligibility to be honored. And some guys have chosen to, to maybe come back or have the opportunity to come back. Uh, some guys aren't part of the program anymore, any longer uh, due to injuries. But 
Um, these have all been kind of approached from an individual basis and the guys that, you know, we're honoring are guys that have exhausted their eligibility. And some of these guys could actually return that have exhausted their, that we're honoring. So it's a different kind of year. And I know it's uh, answers kind of all over the place, but like all like 2020, everything is still up in the air. And uh, we gave guys the opportunity if they want to be honored now, they could be based on their eligibility uh, they have left. And if um, they chose not to or choose not to, then, then they didn't have to. And then just kind of going off that, um, I know it will be kind of case by case, but just kind of having that flexibility um, for someone in a program that's growing and, and improving, how, how much do you think that could help you as a, as a coach just to possibly get some, some of these guys for an extra year? You know, I mean, again, you know, we're more worried about this year. And, and as you know, I'm not a guy that right now is in the business of looking too far down the road. Um, once we kind of get through Rutgers, um, we have a plus one game. I'll deal with that and then see if there's any opportunities for us after that. And then kind of the, the question you ask, sit back and evaluate. But right now, I haven't gotten into that phase of turning the page to, you know, what next year may bring. I just doesn't think it's, I don't think it's fair to the kids in our program now. Um, we want to stay pretty focused on the task at hand, which is for Rutgers. We'll go to Scott Abraham. Hey, Locks, good to see you as always. Uh, obviously, you know, on the schedule, this is the final game of the regular season for you. Big difference between three and two and two and three. Do you kind of relay that message to your players and be like, this is, this is a big game and building in a sense for, for next year and, and, and years after? Yeah, you know, again, we took the approach that it's a big game because it's our next game. Um, have we shared with them the importance of, you know, being able to send our seniors out, uh, hopefully uh, on the right side of the ledger, which we haven't done around here in a while. Uh, undefeated season here at home at the Shell. Um, a chance to finish the regular season with a winning record. These are all things that come into play, but it's the most important piece of it is it's a, it's a big game because it's our next game and, and it's against a, a formidable opponent, uh, an opponent that I promise will come in here and play hard and it'll be a great game and we anticipate it to be a, a full quarter game and um, a, a team like ours needs a good game and a tough game like we know Rutgers will bring us. Take me through the senior day. Obviously, the senior class is special to you, and they brought a lot to the program. Uh, bittersweet in a way, that, that senior day in a sense? It's always that. I mean, for me, it oftentimes have me reflect just how fast time goes. Uh, you know, obviously, this group is a smaller group because they've had a, a ton of attrition, uh, with like we've talked about around here, just all the different um, comings and goings and the things that have happened. So. This group is one that really has shown great perseverance. Um, and, and you look at, it's a small group, but it's one that I've leaned on um, as the leader of the program uh, this year through a very trying year in the 2020. Uh, this team kind of reflects this group's personality. Like they take on mine as a team, they also take on the leadership. And, you know, I can't thank guys like Cherokee Glasgow and Jake Funk and Antoine Richardson and Zach Roski. Shaq Smith, who transferred in, and, and, and you know, Tyler Rockhill, uh, who played lacrosse here. You know, the roles that they've played, and each one has had their own individual roles. Johnny Jordan, Antoine Richardson, all those guys uh, have done a great job of being uh, great representatives of, of what the DNA of being a Terp is all about. So um, definitely bittersweet um, and excited for what the future holds for this group. Thanks, Locks. Yep. We'll go to Lila next. Hey, Locks, how are you? Hey, Lila, how are you? Good. Um, you mentioned that relationship with uh, Greg Schiano, just both with him and kind of with uh, Mel Tucker as well, too. Just one of what is kind of that relationship and those conversations as kind of coaches that are kind of just taking over these, these programs in the Big Ten, especially with a school like Rutgers that is also in a rebuilding phase? Yeah, I mean, again, just I've been one of those guys that, you know, I, I, I admire and look to good coaches. I mean, I'm a guy that studies uh, success and uh, having watched Greg and played and, and coached against him, you know, I was an assistant at Illinois on, on the offense. I was offensive coordinator at Illinois in 05 when we played him and he was to just building that program and to see how he took Rutgers from, you know, a program that 
you know, hadn't had a lot of success to how he built it and did it the right way and was given the right amount of time to do it and, and really put it on a, a pretty strong foundation. I mean, for me, uh, walking into a, a program, you know, like Maryland as a leader, you, you look at programs like that that have been able to do it. And so uh, the relationship with Greg, again, is a mutual respect that I've had for the job he's done wherever he's been. Um, and, and then with Mel, obviously, I've known Mel a good long while and um, knowing what he's all about. So um, just more of a mutual respect for, you know, two guys that, that coach it the right way, that uh, their teams represent who they are. And, I mean, it's great to be in a league like this where you have these types of coaches and they're just two of what I would say is probably the best group of uh, coaches, uh, minus myself probably, you know, uh, in the country. And like, how do you and Greg kind of share those ideals of making, um, you know, your program like kind of a flagship of the, of the state and keeping that top talent home and kind of that instilling that pride? You know, he does it his way. I do it mine. I, I admire him from afar. It's not like, you know, we're on the phone every day talking. Um, he is a guy that there's some things, you know, going on in the league that he, he would be usually one of my first calls or a text message and, um, but no, just, I mean, again, you know, the way they're set up, we both came into this league at the same time. Um, you know, we both are programs. I know we, we feel like we've got a little chip on our shoulders being the new kid on the block. I can't speak for him. Um, but like I said, when you watch his team, uh, the team that he put on the field this year and the strides they've made through their growth phase, it's, it's phenomenal. And that's why for us, what a great opportunity and a great measuring stick to see where we are as we, you know, are in, you know, kind of 1.5 of our since, you know, we haven't played as many games as some of the other teams in our league, but um, a good measuring stick and it'll be a, a great opportunity for us. Thank you. No, thank you. Go to Dave Preston. Good afternoon, coach. Uh, this has obviously been a season like none other. Uh, as What do you feel you've learned the most about yourself? as a head coach this year? And what do you feel that you've learned the most about this team that you're trying to build moving forward? You know, I think the big thing for me, when you reflect back, would be just uh, coaches are creatures of habit. And I have not been allowed to be a creature of habit with 2020, with this season. It has really challenged my creativity, my ability to adjust and, and make adjustments just on the fly within, I mean, a, a 15 minute period from getting ready to play Michigan to, you know, playing music at practice, which we never do to kind of motivate us to get through a practice after you just broke the news that the game was canceled and to see those guys kind of take on that personality. It just really shown me that, you know, maybe we, you know, sometimes as coaches, you know, we get set in our ways and it's, you do it because you're a creature of habit. Well, 2020 has not allowed me to be a creature of habit. And it has shown me that I have a little more flexibility uh, as to who I am as a coach and how we prepare and how we have to do things to prepare our team. It's made me be more creative uh, in my approach. You know, as far as this team, I just can't say enough great things about how this team has made sacrifices. I mean, to have great success as a team, and I know you guys grade success by wins and losses. I grade success on a daily basis by the work we do and the attitude we do to work with. I mean, those are the cornerstones of John Wooden's pyramid, industriousness and attitude, how you do work. And that's how you have success. And every single day we go out, this team continues to amaze me. It has not been perfect every day, so don't get me wrong there. But, you know, we this team just keeps – overcoming and keep dealing with whatever's thrown their way. And I, I like that. And I think a lot of it is because of how much youth is on this team and how young we are, that they don't know what they don't know. But uh, I, I'm really proud of just how they've been able to make some tremendous sacrifices as 18 to 22 year olds during a pandemic, uh, which none of us have ever navigated before and had to make adjustments in their lifestyles, how they live, what they do, where they go. And they just keep on progressing moving forward man and you know momentum is created by your habits and behaviors and and they continue to show the right kind of stuff which is encouraging for me and uh talia uh, tonga vailoa you went with him at quarterback to start the season uh 
what has impressed you about his growth and how difficult is it for a young quarterback or a redshirt sophomore making his first starts to have a couple games, then no game, couple games, no games from a learning curve? What, what, what does that do to a young kid? I mean, I just think playing, as I've said before, when you're in this growth phase, the only, you know, thing that helps you grow is the experience of playing and whether it's practice or in games. And I think anytime we miss opportunities, we miss or miss games, we miss opportunities to go out, make mistakes. And I always say this, you learn more from failure than you typically do success. And with young players, adversity and failure is going to be a part of it. Um, and it's our job to create and fix it. And, and but you know, anytime you miss those opportunities, uh, you know, it, it, it slows down the growth. But what I like about Talia and what I've seen out of Leah is even when we've had the stoppages and we haven't been able to play games, his work ethic and how he approaches the game hasn't changed. He's not one of those guys that when we're not working or games are canceled, he's taking a day off. I mean, the guy lives up in our in the Gossett team house. He's always there. He's always watching film. He's always taking notes. He's starting to show, you know, the leadership you want to see. And he's done it the right way, whereas most of the time you, you, a guy comes in and he starts trying to lead by talking. He's did it the right way by how he practices with his habits and behaviors. And now he has the respect, both offensively, defensively, and special teams of his peers because of that. And now I see him being a little more vocal. I see him getting after a few guys about effort. I see him becoming, you know, we always say you have to have a mind of a coach and the actions of a player. And I, I'm starting to see more and more of, of that out of a young player. And, and, you know, the stops and starts and all those things, as I told you, the key to our success is going to be how we're able to adjust. And he's been tremendous in adjusting to the, all the different things thrown at him. Thanks again, Coach. Thank you. We'll go to Andy Koska next. Hey, Coach. Uh, a few minutes ago, you, you mentioned playing uh, music at, at practice for like the first time. I just was curious, like, why – not play music in the past and what kind of brought you to, to allowing music to be played during practice? Well, one, as I've liked to say, the, the field for us is our classroom and very few times do you walk into a lecture hall with a professor teaching you about macroeconomics. Do you have little baby blasting in the background and them putting stuff on the board? So uh, we're, we're in the business of teaching um, and the field is our classroom and, um, you know, the distraction of of players and where their minds and how long you can keep their attention span. Uh, I used to be a play music at practice guy. And then I went to this place down in Tuscaloosa where uh, we went to three straight national championships and there was no music being played. And you learn very quickly. That's a classroom. It's a teaching environment. And so until I learn or see that playing music in the middle of a teaching or a lecture helps with retention of information, you know, studies come out and show, then I'm a, I'm, I like to follow the footprints of success. And so, yeah, I played it that day at practice after I had to pass the terrible news of a Michigan cancellation just to, you know, music soothes the mind and kind of to change things up. And so we played a little bit of music at practice. We made things really competitive that day. We kind of switched up and that's where I said, you know, I, I, this 2020 has forced me to be creative and to adjust and maybe not be as rigid. But um, like I said, I don't see very many of our Smith Business School professors, you know, blasting you know, Kenny Chesney in the middle of their uh, marketing classes. So I'm going to stick to what teachers and what they do in their uh, classrooms. So, so it's just it's just select uh, practices. You're going to pull up the music, not not every. Uh, no, that was one practice. Let's not get it twisted, Andy. We did it for one practice. Thank you. Appreciate. It. Yep. We'll go to Ed Lee. Mike, earlier you mentioned that uh, you'll have most of the guys off the COVID list. How comforting is that for you to be able to go in this game with almost your full complement of players? I mean, it's great because, as I said, with every game that these guys are able to participate in and play, those are opportunities to learn, grow, and it helps us through this phase of, of growth that we have to go through. This is a necessary phase, uh, and it's not always pretty. It's not always easy, but it is definitely necessary. So um, being able to have most of our guys back um, and having, you know, available to play gives us opportunities to 
you know, do some of the things on offense, defense, and special teams. Uh, having numbers back, we've been able to get back to more of a normal practice. Uh, you know, we had to practice a little bit like an NFL team uh, when we were down all those bodies uh, where, you know, we had to get ready just the group of guys that we had available to play. So we did have a lot of scout teams and second teams. So we cut reps back in an effort to not, you know, overwork and put too much player load on the limited numbers we had. And so we had to adjust how we practice, which by doing that, it stops you from being able to develop to develop the twos and threes like we typically do with how we practice. And now we've been able to get back to, you know, developing the twos and threes in our system. That'll be very meaningful for us uh, as we build the program and work through the growth phase. Can you disclose which players on the COVID list won't be available for Saturday? Yeah, I don't get into the HIPAA COVID stuff, man. I don't talk a lot about injuries. I don't, I don't want you to say I, I had some excuse of why, why we did or why we didn't. So um, we just, I just know this, we've got probably 80 to 90% of the guys back of the, I, mean, I think it was 24 maybe. I don't know what the magic number was because it's just so many. Uh, I know I'm back strong, healthy, got my color back in me. I'm excited about Rutgers this weekend. Uh, happy to, you know, hopefully send our seniors out the right way. Mike, last question. Um, you know, you're not in the running for the Big Ten championship game. Some people might say, well, maybe this is an opportunity to play some of the younger guys who won't see as much playing time just to sort of give them an aud audition. Is that an approach? Is that something you're considering? We're always going to play the players that give us the best chance to win it, and that's not going to change. I can tell you that my philosophy has always been to play a lot of players and force players on the field that can help us win. I'm a big believer in putting players in positions to do what they're capable of getting executed. And the more players we have available, I've always been a guy that wants to play a lot of players because for the growth phase of our program, it's important that we develop our guys. But uh, let's make sure we understand our goal is to put the best players on the field that have the best opportunity to give us a chance to, to have success. And, you know, we're never going to um, forego uh, having success now for the future. I mean, I, I owe it to the seniors. I owe it to this team to put the best product on the field to win. And, and while at the same time developing this team, like the, the way we have been doing so. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for two more. We'll go to Bruce Posner. Yeah, Coach, great to see you healthy, all right? I'm glad to hear yeah. that. Appreciate um, that, Bruce. This has been a very unusual year, all right? And there's been a lot of games that, you know, going into it, people would say, well, that could never happen. Like you demolishing Penn State and the growth of, uh, so, got to say it, it happened. Uh, the, growth of, the growth of Northwestern, the growth of Indiana, some of the struggles of some of the power, power teams. Uh, Maybe with the exception of uh, Ohio State, who still seems to stand above, do you see or do you feel a more parity situation coming to the Big Ten? I mean, I, 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 again, the comparisons are the kiss of death. You guys know I'm not a big dude on comparisons. Uh, we knew 2020 would be this kind of year. We talked about it was going to be unusual. It would be strange. I often believed and said to our team, the team that does the best job of adjusting and handling the, the adversity you're going to face uh, with COVID, with the season, with the games being played, uh, would be the team that has success. And I think that's what you're seeing. And, and you're seeing you know, across the board. This league is, again, I've been in the SEC as an assistant. I've been in the ACC as an assistant. And in this league, it's my second time in this league. You know, I still think from top to bottom, man, with the coaches and the players that this league offers, uh, parity, there's no doubt that there is and will be parity. Now, you have your traditional powers that have had great consistency in their success in this league, but I also see you, you start, you're starting to see, uh, you know, programs that made commitments to stick with, uh, you know, whether it's philosophies or coaches to allow those uh, the fruits of the time and the labor that's put in, and you're starting to see it in programs like Indiana. Uh, you're seeing it now in Rutgers with what Greg is doing over there. And, you know, you know, I just, like I said, uh, 
from our vantage point, we're in our growth phase, I like where we are. Um, like, as I told our team, I think it's important that we head but the finish line. You know, we always talk about the finish and we're kind of in that uh, mode here where we're at the end of the, the, the last third or quarter of our season. And we don't want to coast through it. We want to finish, you know, as we say, we want to head but the finish line and finish through strong. And that's kind of been, you know, our, our, our mindset as we finish it, through, going through the growth phase of year 0.5 or 1.5. I'm not going to call it two because just haven't had enough time with these guys to say, hey, it's been two years. So hopefully that answers your question. And for our last one, we'll go to Ahmed Gafir. Hey, Coach. Uh, no. Hey, buddy. What's up, man? Uh, so I know uh, Isaiah Jacobs, I know he got uh, nicked up a little bit in the Indiana game. Uh, and Chami, he came back. Just wanted to see. I didn't see either of them in the depth chart. Just wanted to see what their availability is for this weekend. And yeah. then yeah. – I would think Chami should be on there as an or. If it wasn't, that would be a typo. Obviously, Isaiah um, dealing with an injury, um, lower leg injury. But um, the depth chart is what it is. Uh, sometimes by the, when I'm forced to put one together, um, it's at that point, that's where they are. And some guys get healthy later in the week and are able. So I would just kind of, you know, when the game starts, man, take a peek and see who's out there because that's kind of what I've had to do with – COVID and 2020 and injuries and all those things. So I, I try to help you guys as much as I can with a depth chart, but um, oh, I do it so early in the week that I can't say that it's a finished product and I don't want to guesstimate. I understand. I understand. And I guess just a uh, follow up, just because I saw Tayon Fleet Davis uh, listed, but he hasn't suited up this year. Is he going to be available this weekend or what's this? He's step? back, man. Fleet Davis is back, you know. I'm excited to see what the fleet has to offer. There you go. All right, guys. Thank you very much.